My name is Rose Schindler. I will tell you my story from the beginning. It's not a very pleasant story. I come from a family of eight children, six girls and two boys. We had a wonderful life under the Czech government. I'm Jewish, by the way, and the Jewish people had the same rights like everybody else. We lived in a three-room house. We had no electricity and we have no bathrooms in the house. Everything we wore was homemade or through dressmakers. And everything we ate came through our ovens. There, there were not more than 1,500 people in, our whole, in the whole village, OK? We had no stores where you could go buy stuff. The only thing we did have is a bakery, OK? That's about it. And maybe a store where you, they would sell paints and, and, and nails and stuff for building. We had two big cities on either side of us. One was called Munkaj, and one was called Ungvar. And there they had about 25,000 people. And if one, somebody wanted to go from Munkaj to Ungvar, they had to go through Serenia, which was my town. So in 1939, the end of 38, a half a dozen Hungarian soldiers came in on bicycles. And they settled over there, and I don't know how long they stood, stood because we did not really pay any attention to them. Life continues, not too bad. But little by little, everything was changing. Within a few months, all of the men in our town were taken on, on, on trucks to go to factories to work, either factories on roads or who knows where. And also, at the same time, all the Jewish businesses were taken away. My father was a tailor in here at a shop in the middle of town. And, uh, and so anybody, all the Jewish people that had stores or shops, they were all taken away. And uh, things were not so good after that was happening. And of course, the men, all the men were taken away for, for six days a week, every day, to do slave labor. Before, we were first class citizens because we were practically running the town. But now, we are third class citizens. We don't have the rights for anything. We had no higher education than middle school, OK? And all of a sudden, while this is happening, all our non-Jewish friends be are beginning to be kind of nasty, calling us dirty Jew, and uh, all kinds of things that were not ever before, OK? So what can you do? You have no choice. We have to just go, go along, because we have no rights anymore. Can you imagine living that way? So this is going on for quite a while, OK, till 1944. In 1944, uh, about two weeks before Passover, my mother said, go get a bread. We had a bakery in our town. Uh, so in the middle of town, of course, we had the farmer's market. And the man is making announcements. Radio was very against the law during the war. And we never had newspapers. So how do you, uh, uh, how do you send the news to the whole little village? So they used a drum. There was one man who had a drum, and he would beat the drum. And this is how we would get together and listen to what's going on in town. Okay? So as I'm going, this man is um, announcing all the Jewish people are going to be shipped away, sent away. Uh, uh, you have uh, one today or tomorrow. You, you'll find out when you'll have to go. Everybody's entitled to take one bag or a suitcase. We had no suitcases because we never traveled. My mother said to me uh, when I got home, uh, go to the fabric store and get some burlap, and we're going to sew it up. And we're all going to have a bag to take with us. And she also tells us, put on a couple of sets of underwears and a couple of socks, because we don't know where we're going, and we don't know if we're going to have a chance to do laundry. Anyway, so I went and got the burlap, and we came home, and we sewed it up. So we each had a bag. And then uh, before we left the house, there were certain things that they asked us to do, the leaders of who are doing all this horrible stuff to us, OK? They said, if anybody has any money or valuables, you can bring it over here, and we're going to keep it for you. And when you come back, you will get it back. You know what BS means. <laughs> I 
I was 14 years old, okay? I had no idea what was going on, really. So, uh, so my father, uh, he put a few pieces of jewelry together in a little shoe polish box. And uh, he said, he, so he's telling, I had two older sisters and an older brother, okay? And he said to us, come with me. Uh, I put a few pieces of jewelry in here. I want you to see where I'm gonna hide it. So after you come back from the war, you will know where it is. So my father already knew a lot more than me or my sisters also, what's going on. So my two sisters said, they don't want to, they are not interested in doing that. So I said, fine, I'm, Dad, I'm gonna go with you. This is how I survived the war, guys, by always doing things. A lot of things were not supposed to be done, but I did it, even as, as I was a child growing up. Lots of spankings, so. <laughs> <laughs> I am wearing a necklace on my neck. This is from my father's pocket watch. So this necklace goes on my neck. The f I put it, I don't sleep in it because I'm afraid that it's gonna be too much pressure and it might break. So uh, the first thing I get up, I, I put it on the counter, I mean on the night table. The first thing I get up in the morning, this is the first thing that goes on my body. And the last thing when I go to bed, when I take it off. I feel that my father is with me. And I, I believe that's how I'm still here all these, you know, because so many of us left. So we go to the school and, and we do whatever we're supposed to do. And then uh, they, they take the names and uh, finally they, uh, they take all the information and then they put us on oxen driven wagons. You know what oxen are, right? I could walk faster than they do. <laughs> so uh, we had no other transportation. We did have some, uh, some horses, but not too many. So they must have squeezed in, I don't know, 30, 40 people on every oxen driven wagon. And they took us to the next city, which was Ushorod. As I said, it took many, many hours, probably eight to 10 hours before we got there. And when we got there, they put up some make-believe tents because there were no buildings. And this is, April 1944, the temperature is about between 25 and 30 degrees. By us, the, temp the, the winter would uh, come in in the fall and leave in the spring. So they must have put in three, four families in each, each tent, and the tents were pretty big size. Every couple of days, they would put people on the trains. So we were over there maybe two weeks, three weeks, I have no idea how long, and finally they put us on a train. They squeezed in 70, 80 people in every train, and they were complete families. Children, you know, families, gr grandparents, aunts, uncles, complete families. And they, they stuck us in there, and then they closed the doors, locked the doors, and off we went. One of my boys went on the internet and he found out how long, how long it took in those days to go from Ushorod to Auschwitz, Poland. Two and a half days. We had no food in the train, we had no water in the train, no place to relieve yourself, so you can imagine what the train must have been. Finally, after going and going, the train slows down and uh, the door opens and a man in a striped uniform comes on the train to help us, help us with our luggage. A shaven man in a striped uniform. I want to tell you that all the work by the, in these camps was done by our own people. If they wouldn't do it, they would shoot you. We had no choice. And so he's looking around and he comes to me, this man, uh, this, uh, this, you know, he's a survivor there helping out. He comes to me, he says to me, how old are you? I said, I am 14. He says, tell him you're 18. I had no idea what he was talking about, okay? So, and he's looking around to see if he could find other young kids to tell, to lie about their age because they're not gonna bring a, bringing us there to have a good time. It's for slave labor. We come in front of three SS soldiers and I believe one of them was Mangala, okay? And he's telling my father and my brother, I had an older brother, go to this line. My mother and three sisters and brothers to this line. My two sisters on this line. And he says to me, how old are you? I said, I'm 18. 
And my sister Helen didn't know I was told to lie about my age. I said, oh no, I'm 18. He let me go with my two older sisters, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. I would have gone with my mother and three sisters and brothers straight into the gas chamber. I never saw my mother and three sisters and brother again. And so they marched us into this building and they told us to take all our clothes off and put it on that on pile over there. And then they shaved our hair, not only our head, everywhere. And they gave us a dress from another pile because all the clothes that we brought with us, you know, when you travel, you always travel in your best clothes. You're not gonna travel in the rags. All those clothes were sent to Germany for their families. So we go outside after a while, after we got our clothes on, the dress on, we go outside and we're standing in line always five in a row. And then there's a, a, a Polish guard standing next to my sister Judy with a gun and a dog. And there's a big fire behind the building. You can see smoke and you can hear children crying and you can hear adults calling names. And really weird, okay? So my sister said to this guard that was standing next to her, what is that noise behind the building? What's the fire and the noise? He says they were burning hair. So she said, uh, burning hair would make this kind of noise. And he said they were burning cripples. So later on, the next day when we came into the barracks, maybe the next day or two, we found out what they did. They didn't even give the people enough gas to kill them all the way. They shoved them out the back door and they burned them half alive. So we knew what happened to our families. Has anybody been to Auschwitz? Oh, quite a few people. It's not a pleasant place, but there's so much history over there. There were three camps separated by 12 foot electric fences. There was a gypsy camp, a, Ch a Czechoslovakian camp, and a Hungarian camp. So ours was a Hungarian ca camp at this time. So, and before we walked in through the gate, there was a big sign. It says, Arbeit macht das Leben frei. Work makes for freedom. So we march into, the, uh, into this camp, and there's 30 barracks over there, okay? One barrack is a kitchen, and one barrack is a bathroom. The bathroom has sinks with cold water and holes in the ground. My two sisters and I ended up in barrack 26, and we walk into our barrack, and we had three rows of bunks. No blankets, no nothing. We, we kept each other's bodies warm. Uh, so we go to sleep, we get up the next morning. So I said to my sisters, I want to go outside, I want to know what's going on. I go outside and I'm walking and I see these electric fence, these fences, 12 foot fences on either side of us. And you see people holding on with their fingers. Holding on, dead people, half dead. A lot of people didn't know it was electric and they would touch it. They were kind of talking to the other, to the gypsies or to the Czech people, you know what I mean? Socializing. So either that or they try to touch the electric fences to commit suicide. Because this started in 1942 and we are here in 1944, okay? You can't even explain how it looked. It, it, was, it, was, it was worse than hell. I'm walking and I see uh, uh, people doing all kinds of things, you know, socializing and stuff. And all of a sudden somebody calls my name. Roisy, Roisy. So, I, fi I figured, my God, I knew I was popular. I didn't know I was so popular that I should be found in this God-forsaken place. It was my father. Before he had a, uh, always wore a suit, a tie, a hat, glasses, a beard, uh, well-dressed, you know. And here he's in a striped uniform, shaven head, no glasses, everything. So when you're used to seeing somebody a certain way, you know, you have to look twice before you recognize him. He says, Roisy, Roisy, don't you recognize me? So we hugged and we kissed, and the first thing he said to me, where's your mother? And at that time, I really didn't know, because this was the first morning there. We, we found out later what happened, in, in, you know, while we were there. So I told him I'm here with my two sisters, Helen and Judy, and my father said, he's here with my brother. They were already selected to go to a factory to work. So uh, this was an all-women's camp, but so two of the barracks had men. So he 
telling me what to, to do. He says, whatever you do, stay together because you have a much better chance of surviving. And also stay alive so you can tell the world what they're doing to us. And we kissed and we hugged and we made up to meet up the next morning. And my father said, bring your sisters. And he said, he's going to bring my brother and we're going to meet uh, a certain time. And the next morning we went and we met my father and, and my brother and uh, we were together and we were talking for a little while. And he repeated the same thing. Whatever you do, stay alive so you can tell the world what they're doing. So this is why I'm, what I'm doing, okay? So we said goodbye and we made up to meet again the next day, but they were gone because this was an old woman's camp. They were all sent away to have some factories to work. Little by little, you know, they are, uh, people are going to factories to work. People are still coming in. Within two months, over 500,000 Hungarian Jews were brought into Auschwitz, complete families. And if 20% of them survived, we are lucky. And I really mean that. After being ten, there 10 days, we probably each lost at least 10 pounds because there's no food. They're always coming to our to our uh, camp to take survivors to factories to work. That's why they brought us there. And sometimes they would make us get undressed to see if we have any flesh on our bodies because you have no idea how some people were skin and bone, really skin and bone. So after, as I said, a week or so, they're going to get selected and putting me in the gas chamber line. And we know what to do. You know, when you're in a place like this, people give you advice what to do. So they had the gas chamber line and the, the line for the people to go to factories to work. So they would tell me, if they put you in the gas chamber line, make sure nobody sees you, get out of the line. And that's what I did. And then my sisters would do the same thing because we promised my father we're going to stay together. So they had to get out of the line and I had to get out of the line. So we did this maybe three, four times and then we decided we are going to wait for the war to end. We we're going to be liberated. So we did, because every barrack has a thousand women. So when they come for two, three hundred women, you know, you don't, you're not forced to go to get selected. After being there about five, six weeks in, in this camp, we found out that we have cousins in barrack number two who is in, char in charge of the barrack. And you know what that means? An extra slice of bread, an extra something, okay? So of course we moved to barrack number two uh, and uh, it was an, an amazing thing for us to be, with, first of all, not only the food, but being with, with relatives together. So finally, while we were to, with our cousins, we probably each put on a couple of pounds because we had extra food. And then they came to our barrack, I think must have been the four months that we were there, and they need 300 women to go to Freudenthal in Germany to a factory to work. So I said to my sisters, you go out and get selected, and I'll see how I can steal myself into this transport. I know they would never select me to go in it, okay? So my two sisters were selected, and then as I'm in the barrack, trying to see how I can, and we had the door in the back of the barrack, and somebody was guarding the door. So I was waiting to see who is going out through that back door. Maybe if I see somebody that maybe knows me a little bit, I can go out with her. So it took me a while, but then I see, saw one lady, she's going out, and I think I may have known her, but I wasn't sure, okay? Uh, so she lets her out, she goes to the back, and she, then I quickly chase to the back door, and she says, where are you going? She says, you're supposed to go through the front to get selected to factory to work. I said, my mother just walked out, I want to go with her. Where this, how this came to my brain to say such a thing, it was a big lie. And she let me out. My sisters held a place for me in line. This is how I got out of Auschwitz-Birkenau. In the meantime, we are here for four months, or maybe a little longer. We haven't had a cleaning in four months. Can you imagine have, not having a cleaning in four months? Our bodies were full of lice. We couldn't sleep at night. They were biting us so badly. So of course, and, and uh, they're not gonna send us anywhere in the, to a factory to work in this situation. So they're marching us to the bathroom. They're shaving our hair again, disinfecting our bodies, giving us decent clothes, underwear, socks, and shoes. It's like a thousand times better than what we had. So finally, we are all dressed and we're all ready to be sh shipped away and we each have a number on our dress, okay? They didn't tattoo us in Auschwitz, but they did tattoo us 
in the factory. So let me show you my, my uh, tattoo. You see this? It's A25, A25893. This was an Auschwitz uh, tattoo. Once you get the tattoo, you, are sa you feel a lot safer because you know that they're going to send you to a factory to work, OK? So finally, they put us on a, on a train, not a train. I think it was some type of wagons. I don't really, I'm not 100% sure. And it took about a couple of days to get to Freudenthal in Germany. We are 300 women, and we are all assigned to different jobs. Um, but of course, we have a building like this. We have mattresses, and, and we have uh, blankets. I mean, it's like uh, heaven compared to what Auschwitz, OK? So I was assigned to work on gas masks. My sister Helen was assigned to work on uniforms, SS uniforms. And my other sister Judy, she was assi assigned to work on, on uh, guns, I believe, yes. So I had to sit on a high chair, pick up a mask, look in the inside, and put it on. 12 hours every day. So after doing that for about 10 days, I said to the people who were serving us lunch every day, I said, you know, this is hard work. I should get an extra meal. <laughs> Doesn't hurt to ask. Remember, if you need something, don't be afraid to ask. <laughs> the worst thing is you get a no answer, OK? So she says, sure, you could have an extra meal. And what we, I used to do is take that meal into the living quarters, and I would share it with my sisters. Finally, we're working, and everything is going great, OK? And uh, they're always telling us, if you don't do good work, they're going to send us back to the Auschwitz. And you know what Auschwitz means? A crem crematorium, OK? So this is going on for about eight months. And they always used to come to our building to march us to the factory to work. It was like a five-minute walk. But anyway, nobody's coming to pick us up. This must have been May 6th or 7th. I'm not really sure what day. So, uh, we're waiting and waiting, and finally, I said to my sisters and all the other ladies, I probably was the youngest girl over there, and I had, the, I had more guts than anybody else over there, too. <laughs> I said, I'm going out. I want to see what's going on, okay? So they said, well, you can't go out. It's locked. I said, I'm going to try and get out. So I go, I go out. The door is wide open. It wasn't even locked. I go out, and the, the, uh, the electric uh, gate is wide open. All the Germans run away. And then I hear planes going over us, and we hear sh shooting guns. The, the Russian soldiers were coming through the cornfields, through the back of the building. We were wearing regular clothes. We were not wearing uniforms. So I figured if I go in front of the Russians in, regular, in a regular dress, they would think I'm a, a German woman. They would probably kill me, OK? Because that the Russians were very easy with their guns, OK? So I tore a piece of my dress off, and I found a stick, and I put that piece of material from the dress on the stick, and I went like this in front of the Russians in back of our building. I went there, and they liberated us. They hugged me and kissed me, and I told them we have 300 women here. And they, the Russians were very good to us, let me tell you. So the Russian soldiers came, and he, one of them asked me, do you want to go to town? I said, sure, I could, I could use an extra dress, an extra pair of shoes, or whatever, you know. So, um, so we go into town, and I said, can I bring a friend with me? Because I was afraid to go with a lot by myself with him. And I think that day, I think I was reborn. My, there, something happened in my body. Like, something went through my body. I couldn't believe that I was free. I can do what I want. It, finally, the end of the war. It was an amazing feeling in my system. I don't know how it happened. So we had to stay about two weeks in this place. And finally, we decided it's time to go to a train station and try to go home. While we were at the train station, there were all kinds of people there. And my sister Helen, there were some Czech soldiers at the train station. And my sister Helen met a Czech soldier at the station, and they fell in love. <laughs> he was such a good looking guy. Everybody fell in love with him. But before we left the train, Tibor said to my sister, this young, gorgeous young man, he says, here is my key to my house in Prague. You go home, see who survived the war. Then you come to Prague, and you're going to live with me. Anyway, so as we were going home, it took uh, four weeks to get home. And we were having a good time, actually, meeting all kinds of people all along. And all of a sudden, the whole world is so kind to us. They're offering us to sleep at night. 
okay? Where was the world when we needed them? Nobody offered to help us. Unbelievable what happened to us. So the first thing we did was uh, we found a stool and we climbed up and got, got the little jewelry box, the, the shoe polish box where we were hiding the jewelry. And that's when we divided the jewelry between us. No parents came, came back from the war. No mother or father, not one. Of course, not too many people came back to my village. Only about 18 or 20 people came back. We had 600 people there. Somebody came home that was with my father in camp and he told us what happened to my father. My father was in a factory working and he got sick and they put him in the gas chamber, they couldn't help him. So we knew my father's gone. A few days later, somebody else came back that was with my brother in a camp, okay? They were in Germany in a big factory working, 300 men, and 10 days before the war ended, they took the whole camp into the forest, made them dig a big hole and they killed everybody. So I said, so how did you survive? He says, I could not leave my bunk bed. He was so sick. He survived. All the others were killed. So anyway, so we knew what happened to my father and my brother. So there's no reason for us to stay here anymore. Helen says, I am leaving for Prague. So she left for Prague and Judy and I stayed behind because we wanted to see who else is coming home. So we stayed another couple of weeks. Not too many people were coming home. Finally, I said to Judy, I think we need to leave. So we're going to the train station to Ushorod, and we couldn't get on a train. We were there three days, and uh, Judy said to me, I'm going back to my hometown. My, uh, there's a young man who got his house back. He wants to marry me. We're going to stay in Serenia. Okay, you want to stay? Fine. I'm not going to go back to Serenia. I'm going to go to Prague where Helen is. So I waited another day, and then I finally got on the train to go to Prague. So my sister Helen said to me, there is a, a gentleman by the name of Sir Leonard Montefiore who is looking for a thousand Holocaust survivor children under age 16 to take to England for rehabilitation. And Helen thought this would be a good idea. They found 732 kids. And of course, a lot of us were old, older because none of us had any identifications. The, the planes that came to pick us up, they came from England, okay? Because it's Sir Leonard Montefiore was from England, and they used the bomber planes, all right? And they couldn't put more than 30, 35 kids on each bomber plane. So it took many, many trips. It started in August 1945 till February 1946. So I stayed in Prague till the last transport. So I left in February 19. Uh, 46, uh, we left, the last transport left, and we ended up in Scotland, okay? There were about 35, 40 kids, and they're taking care of us, they're teaching, English, they're teaching us the language. This was an organization called Hashomer Hatzair, which means we are for Israel. We were 12 of us left in this hostel in Scotland, so they sent us to Bedford, okay, which is not far from London. 12 kids, of half of girls and boys. We came to Bedford, okay, and they were mostly all Polish and German boys, about 40 kids or so, okay. So they introduced us the next day, and there was a young man in the back, a gentleman. I said, that's the man I'm going to marry. <laughs> and of course, he already had a girlfriend. <laughs> so it took some time. Uh, finally, uh, the hostel was emptying out because a lot of the kids are finding relatives in Australia, New Zealand, Bolivia, you know, because we're all orphans, okay? So we're looking for families, really. They told us we could go to live in London, we could go to Liverpool, we could go to Manchester. So we decided to go to London, and Max decided to do the same thing, and his girlfriend stayed behind, okay? And that's when we started dating, okay? <laughs> So uh, it took me a while, but I got him. That's what, that's what it is. Don't ever give up, guys, <laughs> girls and boys. If you like somebody, remember it, it can happen. So finally, uh, we ended, we, they put me in a private Jewish home where the government, where, where the organization would pay for our upkeep. And they did this in many, for, many, for many kids. And of course, we started dating, okay? And by 1948, we got engaged. By 1950, Max and I got married. It was the first wedding of survivors in London, okay? We invited all the survivors in London.
in the meantime, uh, a lot of kids are leaving. A lot of kids are going to America. They're going all, all over the world, wherever there's relatives. Max was corresponding with some relatives in New York, and they offered to bring us to New York. So I said, this is my dream. Uh, I, my dream to go to the United States, OK? So they sent us papers. We came to the, the New York in 1951. So here we are in New York. Uh, we speak perfect English, OK? So we found uh, a room in somebody's house. We, uh, we started in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. We were working already so for one year. And after one year, uh, Max's uncle had an apartment house. And somebody moved out, so we got an apartment. So we lived in New York for five years. And after five years, we, some of our friends were here in San Diego. And Max, actually, he tried to do all kinds of work the, the first two years, uh, two, three years in, in New York. He did not have much luck. I, I got a job in the garment industry. And I tell you, I made more money than lawyers. <laughs> because it was piecework, and I was so fast. My husband, he couldn't make much. He probably made a third of what I was making. So we, I was lucky then in that way, OK? So after five years, we had a nice bundle of money already. So, uh, so uh, Max comes to San Diego just to see what's going on, OK? And he calls me. He came for Christmas time, 1955, I believe. Was it 55, OK? He came for three days. He calls me two days later, Rose. He says, Rose, pack up. We're moving to San Diego. <laughs> He got a, my husband got a job, double pay what he was getting in New York at Solar. I don't know if anybody knows where that is. After living in Allied Gardens for 10 years, I needed another bigger house, so we moved to Del Cerro. We have four kids, nine grandkids, one great-grandchild. And I want to say that we are so thankful to this country for letting us come and make a new life for ourselves. Because this is the best country in the world, guys. And I really mean that. So thank you very much for listening to me. If anybody has any questions, I'll be very glad to answer it.